I've been a little busy lately, haven't been able to keep up with the news. So let's uh, check the headlines from recent months regarding the inequity of religious freedom. Uh, Roy Moore's Twisted History. Islam and Buddhism don't have First Amendment protection, Chief Justice says. Alabama's Chief Justice Roy Moore gave a sermon for pastors in which he said that religion, as defined in the First Amendment, applies only to his own version of the Creator and that the Free Exercise Clause doesn't apply to other religions. He says, they don't want to do that because that acknowledges the Creator God. And this line is already wrong on multiple levels. First of all, if there was a Creator God, then anybody who believes in gods at all should already know that. Christianity would not be one of many different religions, each with thousands of denominations. And uh, two-thirds of the world either believes in a conflicting image of God, a completely different God, or no God at all. And yet Justice Moore seems to think that a billion Muslims or so are secretly living a lie because they secretly believe in the Christian God and just don't want to acknowledge that as if only Justice Moore has sincerely held beliefs and not the overwhelming majority of the rest of the world. Expressing his ignorance even further, he goes on to say that Buddha didn't create us, Muhammad didn't create us, he's the God of the Holy Scriptures. Doesn't specify the Bible, just the Holy Scriptures. That's a little vague for somebody in my perspective. Uh, according to his own Holy Scriptures, Jesus didn't create us either. I know a lot of people say that Jesus is God, but Jesus never said that himself. Jesus always said that God was someone else, somewhere else. And I know we could argue this uh, at another time, but um, Jesus was on the same level as Muhammad and Buddha with regard to the Creator. Now some Buddhists worship uh, Buddha as a god, others don't. The original Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was apparently an atheist himself, and he said that uh, whether gods exist or not is irrelevant. However, Justice Moore is wrong about Islam because that's a different version of God than the one he believes in. This is God the Father, also known as Abba in the New Testament, also known as Allah in the Holy Scriptures, known as the Quran. Moore should also be aware of Lord Krishna, a pre-Christian Christ figure, who reportedly performed many miracles, including giving sight to the blind. One thing that, that Krishna did that Christ never did was that Krishna said that he himself created the world. In fact, he said that he created the whole universe all by himself, and he said that in the holy scriptures known as the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Mahabharata. It is one of the more recent of the Hindu scriptures, and yet it's still centuries older than most of the Old Testament. One thing that Christians fail to understand is that Judaism is older than Christianity and that Hinduism is the oldest religion in continuous practice. And also, there are twice as many Hindus in the world today as there are Protestant Christians like Justice Moore. So he should probably acknowledge them. I'm having some trouble advancing this. According to Moore, the government, the government and the Supreme Court should define religion the way James Madison and George Mason did. Uh, the duties we owe to the Creator and the manner of discharging it. Uh, his citation refers to this quote, but Justice Moore apparently hasn't read the rest of it. That religion, or the duty which we owe our Creator and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men have an equal, natural, and unalienable right to the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, and that no particular religious sect or society ought to be favored or established by law in preference to others. Justice Moore's own citation speaks against him, stating clearly that Christianity and the worship of the God of biblical scriptures should not 
be favored or established by law in preference to any other religion. George Mason was consistent on this point. His draft of the Virginia Declaration of Rights contained one of the first state guarantees of free exercise. In 1776, George Mason submitted a bill to the Virginia Assembly ending support of the previously established Anglican Church, wherein he said, it is contrary to the principles of reason and justice that any should be compelled to contribute to the maintenance of a church with which their consciences will not permit them to join and from which they can derive no benefit. Contrary to reason and justice, what if you can't reason with justice more? Remember that most Christians don't agree with uh, more, uh, but uh, Anglicans and Catholics are different denominations, not different religions. And that's what we're talking about, because that same sentiment appeals to, uh, or applies to the religion of Christianity as seen through the eyes of other religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. And Justice Moore's citation of James Mason, James Mason serves him no better. Experience witnesseth that ecclesiastical establishments, instead of maintaining the purity and efficacy of religion, have had a contrary operation. During almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial? What have been its fruits? More or less, in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the laity, in both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. And Justice Moore is demonstrating all of that again. And what did you expect? He's in Alabama. <laughs> Let's see if it's any better in Arkansas. Arkansas town bans pagan temple after finding out it's not Christian. <laughs> this guy named Bert Dahl lives in the town of Beebe which I guess makes him a BB doll. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but then, seriously, this was a small town and he was able to talk directly to the mayor about using a building behind his house. I think it was a, a, a garage that's a separate structure. Using this building behind his house as a church. The mayor reportedly had no problem with that. Apparently you can set up a church anywhere you like as long as it's a Christian church. But of course this turned out to be a pagan church in Arkansas. And once the mayor realized that, he sent a letter to the city code officer ordering a cease and desist, even though the church hadn't actually opened yet. And that letter also said that no conditional or special use permits may be issued, even though none were requested because the mayor had already said that wouldn't be a problem. But now things are different. The city attorney said that the zoning code prohibits places of worship and private nonprofits. But local journalists reviewing the zoning code actually found that it allows both of these things. And they found that the neighbors were already running similar churches, except, of course, that they were Christian. But the city said that Dahl would need a permit. So he asked for the paperwork. And the city said there was no paperwork they could give him, but that if they did give it to him, he wouldn't be approved for it anyway. This is the way the story was reported, both in text and in video. So he turned to the alderman, who offered no assistance, but issued only one comment for journalists to report as to why. He said that Dahl had been denied because, quote, that man's God isn't my God. So apparently, Congress has one version of the First Amendment, which was amended again for Arkansas. <laughs> and amended again for Missouri. <laughs> Speaking of Missouri, there were two police officers in the Ferguson area suspended for making public statements of hateful threats, including murder. One of these police officers said that protesters should have been put down like rabid dogs. Another of these police officers said that, or another of these police officers admitted to having killed, as he put it, a lot of people, and that he would kill a lot more. He declared himself a devout Christian, expressed his bigotry against women, against Muslims, 
and against homosexuals. And he describes Supreme Court justices as, uh, let me see, black-robed or no, perverted sodomites. He also said that the Bible was the foundation of the Constitution and that he could straighten out the Supreme Court about that. I say no, he can't because it wasn't, and I can straighten him out about that. But what more can you expect from a state where this happens? No, um, Missouri schools may have to alert parents when evolution is taught. So this bill would allow and encourage parents to take their kids out of school for what would implicitly be excused absences in order to prevent them from being exposed to forbidden knowledge. It's like that line out of Futurama, I don't understand evolution and I need to protect my kids from understanding it. <laughs> of course, this bill was sponsored by a Republican. No surprises there. According to recent polls, less than half of Republicans accept reality. <laughs> Whether it's evolution, climate change, or the germ theory of disease. State Representative Rick Bratton said that the teaching standards that were approved by the National Science Teachers Association count as indoctrination because they mandate that we teach only one side. Mr. Bratton, regarding the history and diversity of life on Earth, there is only one side. Evolution is an inescapable fact of population genetics. Intelligent design was disputed by science and refuted in a court of law. It's creationism, a form of religious extremism, a denial of reality that dedicated to legendary fables which are literally fairy tales by definition. Evolution is real. And I welcome the opportunity to prove that to any creationist politician stupid enough to accept my challenge. And of course, we know that they won't. Now, Bratton also said that requiring schools to teach evolution was an absolute infringement on people's beliefs. Because, as I pointed out so many times, among religious extremists, truth is irrelevant. Whether you believe matters more than whether it is true. And all of the claims that religion makes fall into only one of two categories. Not evidently true and evidently not true. There's a, there is a distinct difference between those two. And, now, and Rick Bratton admitted that what he believes is not evidently true. And he knows it's not. Because he also said <laughs> that what's being taught is just as much faith and, you know, just as much pulled out of the air as any religion. If we have one advantage over religious ideologues, other than the fact that we can prove that we're right, it is that they are so dumb, they don't know how dumb they are. <laughs> I want to point out once again that evolution is a matter of verifiable fact, requiring absolutely no faith whatsoever, because it is exclusively, exhaustively, and unanimously implied by all the available evidence from every relevant field of study and contested by none. But this isn't about what Rick Bratton doesn't know about science. It's about what he does know about religion. Because this creationist just admitted that any religion, including his own, was pulled out of the air. If you don't understand that phrase, it is an American colloquialism referring to something that was made up, imagined out of nothing fabricated, a tall tale with no basis in fact and thus no truth in it, yet asserted as though it were true. In other words, a lie. I can only assume that, that uh, Mr. Bratton knows what he said and what it meant, in which case that's a, quite an admission for somebody who's attempting to defend the faith and who is intent on denying an actual factual education for other people's kids. This is what we can expect of the politics of the religious right. 
ignorance, deception, um, misleading children, deceiving little old ladies, in order to preserve a preferred belief, even when they occasionally absent-mindedly admit that they know it's not really true. This is why I say that religion is a matter of make-believe. That story was from back in February. The bill passed initial hearings, but eventually died, so we don't have to uh, retry Kitzmiller versus Dover again. Or do we? Because this story is from last month, although it uh, began in February. At that time, Republican Mike Fair said it was wrong to teach natural selection as if it were a fact. Here is another elected leader who needs an education before he should legislate it. And I like that this is the way the article reads in Forbes. Ignorant barely, <laughs> barely begins to describe this statement. Mike Fair clearly doesn't have the faintest grasp of biology or genetics. He's the last person that anyone should want to weigh in on science standards. His behavior goes far beyond mere ignorance, though. Not only is he wrong, but he wants to use the power of the state to impose his religious views under the guise of science on every student in South Carolina's schools. Now, admittedly, this article was written by somebody who moved out of South Carolina because he felt ostracized by that culture. But it means that we not only have to cite Kitzmiller versus Dover again, we also have to fight or cite Edwards versus Aguilard. That's when a Louisiana law tried to impose biblical creationism. The U.S. Supreme Court sided with 72 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 17 state academies of science, and seven other scientific organizations to conclude that evolution is a matter of actual science or scientific fact, wherein, or whereas uh, creationism ain't nothing but blind faith. Now, despite all of this, Louisiana still managed to pass a bill allowing public school teachers to use pseudoscience supplements to promote creationism and denigrate every aspect of actual science that the religious right wants to reject. No amount of proof will ever change their mind. Uh, for example, Go uh, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal described the teaching of creationism as being the best science possible. He said, let's teach the kids both sides and let them make up their own minds. What are we afraid of? Okay. Let's teach the kids both sides, the truth and the lie. Except that we'll have professional educators tell the kids that the, or convince the kids that the truth is only a theory and that a compilation of already falsified fables with no truth in it is the absolute truth from an unquestionable authority. Then we can let them make up their own minds after we've deceived them and deprived them of the ability to make an informed decision. Well, why stop there? Let's teach the kids that the Holocaust never happened, that the moon landing was staged, that 9-11 was an inside job, and that the president is a foreign-born Islamic socialist. Why stop there? Let's teach the kids about Bigfoot, our military cover-up of the UFOs, and the reptiles from the Sirius star system who infiltrated our government from Area 51 and are now in control of the Illuminati. <laughs> Why stop there? Let's teach our kids that the Earth is hollow, with a prehistoric world inside it, that the moon is made of green cheese, that Columbus discovered Ohio in 1942, and that Benjamin Franklin was the first king of America. Now, I would have thought that these last two examples would have been too extreme to consider, but alarmingly, even libertarian atheists have told me that if parents are paying for kids' education and that's what they want them to learn, then that's what they should be taught. And whether any of that is true or not doesn't matter at all. And that's why people homeschool, isn't it? Which brings me back to Texas. Texas court rules against homeschoolers who expected rapture and stopped teaching their kids. <laughs> well, at least there's some good news. <laughs> this story explains that the kids' education stopped in 2004. 
That was 10 years ago. Anyone who was old enough to go to school then is old enough to work now, except they can't because they don't know anything because their parents cheated them by keeping them stupid. This article goes on to explain that one of the daughters ran away from home to go to school. How backward is that? This is why I say that religion reverses everything. Truancy charges were filed in 2007, and the parents saw fit to, file, to fight a legal battle for seven years while they refused to teach their kids reading, writing, and arithmetic in the interim. They refused to teach their kids. Have you ever noticed that whenever parents are so bad at parenting that they get in the news for it, it's usually for religious reasons? This report says that, uh, or the story reports that children were never seen reading or doing any kind of homework. They just sang and played songs while they wait for the end of time. I've known people like this. I knew a family that had seven kids, and they refused to mow the lawn or fix that hole in the wall because Jesus was coming back too soon for all that to matter. That was 50 years ago. And according to this story, the battle is all about whether religious parents have an absolute right, or just parents in general, if they have an absolute right to educate their kids or not completely free of state supervision, regulation, or requirements. And it seems to be all about the rights of deeply religious parents as if their kids have no right of their own. Do children in this country have a right to be educated? Do they have a right to be taught things that are actually true instead of being made to believe fabricated nonsense that can be readily disproved by any panel of scientists and historians? Given these examples, it occurs to me that parents are often the worst authorities about what should be taught in school, especially if they have no background in education themselves and no expertise in what they profess. But as we've seen so far, it's not just children being misguided by parental authority. It's also parents being misled by every higher authority. Does this happen only in the South? No, but it seems to. Let's just look at South Dakota. There they have a law requiring doctors to lie to their patients, warning of increased risk of depression, psychological distress, and suicide. These statistics were never indicated, but doctors are legally required to report them as if they had been. The article cites an American Psychological Association who reportedly said that the vast preponderance of, of medical and academic research published to date indicates that among adult women who have an unplanned pregnancy, the relative risk of mental health problems is no greater if they have a single elective first trimester abortion than if they deliver that pregnancy. However, the article also says that the new law does not privilege fact over fantasy. There's an old saying that he who respects the law or fine sausage should not witness either being made. This ruling was based on a study whose results could not be confirmed because they included calculation errors that were detected in peer review. It also includes cases where depression had been diagnosed before the abortion as if it had been caused by the abortion. And it uh, implies the same sort of thing for events that occurred years later and are apparently unrelated. Yet, once again, facts be damned when the agenda of the religious right is concerned. In the fashion we've come to expect from religious fundamentalists, the burden of proof has been shifted such that they don't have to show that their citations are correct. Instead, critics of this law would have to prove that abortion was never a significant causal factor in suicides. In other words, the ideologues can say whatever they want without any support at all, but you can't criticize that unless you can prove a negative and do it with scientific certainty. Is this the way our system of legal government is supposed to work? Is this the way science works? No. Demonstrably false fabrications of deliberately deceptive misinformation? That's how religion works. Whenever we discuss abortion, it is appropriate to consider instances of rape 
And this is a fine example of that. Okay, so uh, the woman seeking an abortion after being raped at gunpoint by her father-in-law. Yeah. So what are the chances that you're going to get an abortion in an area where you have to abide by Sharia law? But just as it says here, Islamic clerics ordered that she must live with her father-in-law, the rapist, as his wife, and that she must treat her actual husband as though he were her son, because her unborn child will be his brother. It would be funny if it weren't real. <laughs> but notice here that the clerics assume that the father-in-law really did repeatedly rape this woman at gunpoint and that he really did impregnate her. They don't even question the charges. They assume that he's guilty. But they're not concerned about what he did to her, and they're not concerned about what he will continue to do. They assume that even though he will, they, they expect that he will be found guilty, but they don't expect that he will be punished of a crime. And they don't imagine that she will get the abortion she's asking for either. She will obviously get no justice at all. She will even be criminalized if she doesn't sacrifice her rights, give up her actual marriage, and submit to a violently abusive, life-threatening rapist for the rest of her life. This is the kind of insanity we can expect of any theocracy. And when you describe laws and politics, or laws and policies as being insane, you understand that I'm not assuming that religion is a mental disorder. But I call it insane because it is irrational, irresponsible, unreasonable, reactive, and sociopathic. This is why we need a more secular society, because this is what you see whenever you look at countries where religion rules over law. For example, let's look at Afghanistan. Struggling to keep an Afghan girl alive after a mullah is accused of rape. Okay. So a mullah is the Islamic equivalent of a vicar or high priest. And this guy was accused of, of raping a girl in the mosque after a Quranic recitation. He was arrested, and he confessed to having sex with the girl. But in his defense, he said that it wasn't rape. Now, we needn't be concerned about how inappropriate his advances were, because he assures us that she responded and that it was consensual. Now, his accusers say that she wasn't yet of legal age to give consent, but he took her to be 17 and therefore legal in that part of the world. However, her parents and the medical examiner confirmed that she was only 10, that she weighed 40 pounds, that she hadn't yet developed any secondary sexual characteristics, and that the rape had been so violent that it caused a rupture between the vagina and the rectum, and that she bled so profusely that she nearly died waiting emergency medical care. But if that's not outrageous enough, it gets worse, because this is one of those backward places where it is the girl's fault if she gets raped, and the family wants to conduct an honor killing to murder their own daughter because she dishonored them by being the innocent victim of a sickening criminal whom they entrusted to look after her. This is why I say that religion is insane. Now, the only option to killing the girl is that the mullah who raped her nearly to death has offered to marry his prepubescent victim. As if that would solve the problem. And he's able to make this offer because he's free. He's not concerned about prosecution either. And you know why? Because the director of the woman's shelter who brought these charges received so many death threats from other mullahs that she fled town and went into hiding. Then the police raided the clinic that was treating the girl and turned her over to her family, who then, in front of witnesses, told the girl that they were going to kill her. And I don't mean saying, I'm going to kill you when I get home. I mean, it's a little bit more sincere a statement than that. And isn't it sad that no one is surprised to hear this stuff anymore? And whether we're talking about Islamic or Christian fundamentalists, it doesn't really make any difference, does it? 
I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody about the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria and how minority opinions with regard to religion have been given the ultimatum to uh, submit or else convert to Islam or die and all the other horrific atrocities that are typically associated with that kind of theocratic tyranny. We hear the same thing from Duck Dynasty, from John Hagee out of San Antonio, from Pat Robertson, and from any number of fundamentalist Christians. This is what happens whenever religion gets its way. They're always nice and seemingly polite until they get the upper hand. And then when any religion rules, the result has historically always been an automatic violation of human rights. Christianity has already been there and done that, and that offers our one ray of hope. Because within any oppressive dominion such as Islam is, and Christianity was, there are people, real human beings, who are smarter than the herd mentality being manipulated by inflammatory propaganda. The reason that Christianity did not remain the oppressive entity that it was in the Dark Ages is because humanity on the whole tends to be more moral and more compassionate than whatever sickening ideology is in power. And this is especially true when the standard of living rises and the population is educated. Then the ratio is that the more outrageous the lunatic fringe, the more mainstream the objection. As we speak, Muslims around the world are condemning the atrocities of ISIS and other similarly violent groups. Likewise, some Christians are opposing the fascist factions in their right wing and are either adopting a more moderate tolerance or they're abandoning the faith altogether. There's quite a lot of them doing that, which brings me to my next point. What America's religious right needs to understand is that here and around the world, Christianity is in a general state of decline while Islam is growing. It's the fastest growing religion, and it is growing fast. It will soon be the dominant religion, and when I say soon, I mean we're likely to see that happen. And one th in, uh, whatever laws the Christians make to accommodate their own faith today will only pave the way for Islam to seize power over them tomorrow. And another thing that Christian and Muslim mainstream needs to understand is that you can't fight religion with religion, but you can fight it with reason. As you can see, or it doesn't show the, the growth rate here, but atheism is growing too. We're the fastest growing demographic with respect to religion. We're actually growing, I think, faster than Islam. And in a sense, when you look at a chart like this and bear these numbers in mind, it is as if Islam and atheism are in a race to either save or enslave the United States when Christianity loses political influence. And we advocate secular governments because that's the only way everyone can have the right to think or believe according to their own conscience. And with that, I have to return to Alabama's Justice Roy Moore. This is the same guy who in 2003 had to have a federal judge order him to remove a two and a half ton monument to the Ten Commandments from his courthouse. He had to have a superior court judge tell him why this was unconstitutional and he still doesn't get it. He thinks those Ten Commandments are the foundation of American government. I wish I could get him to see the presentation I did a few months ago wherein I proved that the American government was definitely not founded on any of the damn commandments. But it's sad when the facts don't matter to a judge. It is appropriate that this image is in black and white uh, because simple people want leaders who uh, believe in extreme black or white dichotomies, who stand by their convictions and are firm in their beliefs. They better hope they don't get what they prayed for because they don't realize they're asking to be governed by unreasonable people. Because you can't reason with someone when they are firm in their beliefs. It doesn't matter what you plead, they're going to stand by whatever convictions they had to begin with. And if you voted for that person for that reason, then you are asking to be governed or ruled or judged according to prejudicial biases and without due consideration. And rather than being limited to black or white thinking, most people realize that almost no one 
is that extreme either way. More thoughtful people would measure someone's situation on a bell curve of gradient grays, which in the world of artists, this is appropriately known as a scale of values. And one of the advantages of wisdom, which is actually seen as a flaw in our elected leaders, is the ability to recognize multiple options and consider extenuating circumstances. But that perspective isn't black or white or gray. It's analogous to a spectrum of color. If we don't have the foresight to elect people of vision, or if we can't see what needs correction, then it will continue to be the blind leading the blind. Which brings me to Texas Governor Rick Perry. I can't tell you how happy I am that he won't be our governor anymore. Everything I have ever read or heard from him seemed to be a deliberate effort to destroy the environment, the economy, and the middle class by deregulating industry, undermining education, and subverting every program of benefit to women or the poor. He has also executed hundreds more prisoners than any other governor in history, and he has done all he could to promote his religion in public schools. For example, Last year, a Texas legislator proposed the Merry Christmas Bill, which would have teachers endorsing their personal religious convictions to their students during the holidays. Now, this would marginalize non-Christian kids even worse than they were before, but it would also force some teachers to reveal what should be privately held beliefs, not to be scrutinized by principals, pupils, or the PTA, because Teachers with a minority opinion with regard to religion can be outed by students or faculty. And we've seen from personal experience and some things we can cite in the news that if you don't believe what your administrators do, that can put your job at risk. So if you Google this bill today, you'll see that mine is the only voice of opposition that was reported in the newspapers when I said that you can't have freedom of religion without freedom from religion. So I took it personally when Rick Perry signed this bill into law, of course, because he turned to the cameras and said that freedom of religion is not freedom from religion. According to Rick Perry and other dominionists like him, Americans have no right to freedom from religion. Whatever is the dominant religion at the moment, will be imposed against all objections. And that means the next dominant religion will be too. It's hard to imagine how things will change in the future if you don't believe there is a future, if you think that you're living so near to the end of the world. And that's important to consider when you think about the beliefs of your elected leaders and how that may influence their decisions. Because although Perry won't be our governor anymore, look at the candidate who's expected to succeed him. This guy is funded by the Koch brothers, and his multi-million dollar uh, campaign is leading in the polls. And look how he frequently puts himself, Edward depicts himself in the backdrop of the Ten Commandments. Will he be any more reasonable, rational, or cost-effective than Perry was? I'll quote from the Washington Post. Abbott likes to describe his job like this. I go to the office. I sue Barack Obama, and I go home. He sued the Obama administration two dozen times. Uh, he is, he's one of several attorney generals who has sued over Obamacare, over mandated contraception coverage, over Environmental Protection Agency pollution standards, and the Voting Rights Act. He sued the EPA 17 times. He also argued the Supreme Court uh, 2005 decision uh, allowing the, the state capital to display the Ten Commandments. The Supreme Court allowed this, saying that people waited too long to complain. Make of all that what you will, but consider this also. Rick Perry resigned as governor so that he could pursue another presidential campaign, but a recent poll of Texas Republicans say that they actually prefer Ted Cruz another science-denying ideologue wrapped in a flag and carrying a cross. Imagine our future in either instance. 
I remind you that Texas is one of seven states where it is illegal for an atheist to hold public office. It's in our state constitution that there is no religious test as long as you affirm a belief in a supreme being. It should never be that a candidate's eligibility should require a irrational belief in indefensible nonsense on insufficient evidence or, for, or with unreasonable conviction. Especially, quite the opposite, especially if we're electing a leader. I would think that such a position would or should disqualify someone from ruling or judging over the affairs of others. Religion should have no influence over legislation ever. It is not a virtue and does not lead to good decisions. So religion has no place in politics and deserves no respect either. One would think, but uh, are you also aware of what the Air Force did recently? Yeah. yeah. It, sometimes when, when the victory is so clear and when it is so obvious who's in the wrong, you have to wonder why didn't they just fess up to this originally? I mean, why, why will they not release a statement? Why don't they just correct the policy? You know it's going to go to court and they're going to have to drag it out in embarrassing ways. They could just say, yeah, we were wrong and fix it, but that's not the way things happen. But thank you for that. Oh, the U.S. Air Force has decided to implement a thing where if you want to re-enlist or if you're, you're already in, but you want to renew, you have to swear under God. You have to swear your, you have to confirm in a sworn oath your belief in God. They won't let you write that out. You can't stand silent. They're going to make you declare that you believe on a sworn oath that you believe in a supreme being, that you believe in God, whether you do or not. There's no question as to how wrong that is. The only question is, which country do we live in again? So I can't wait to see how that turns out. Question here. Well, in this, okay, you said South Dakota, they're making the doctors lie to their patients? Yes. But what if the doctors are Christian? Isn't there something in the commandments about thou shalt not bear false witness? So you're forcing them to bear false witness? Yes, but thou shalt not bear false witness does not mean do not lie. It really doesn't. If they couldn't lie, then how could they profess to witness things they've never really seen? It means that you're not supposed to ac falsely accuse your neighbor. So you can lie all you want to. And you kind of have to. <laughs> I'm sorry, next question, please. Yes, yes, I can give you this much of a clue. While there's, there's two ways to look at this. Uh, you can imagine that Greece and Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, a couple other places were once democratic centers of education and knowledge and that they had all fallen 
before religion. And you can see parallels in the articles that were written at the time to see things like, like the, the Bush W administration being mirrored back then. So you can think that that's the way that we're going. But you have to also remember that the entirety of Europe was un un once under the heel of the church and that they have come out of that. And that when the, the standard of living rises and the population is educated, that the church can't maintain their hold and they can't maintain that kind of dominance anymore. So it could go either way. Next. Yes. Here it is. Do you think that one of the reasons a lot of these fundamentalist Christians in the United States are holding on to their religion is the fear of Islam? Yes, but as with all other things in their belief system, and again, I'm speaking obviously from my own opinion, um, as with all other things in their belief system, it's wrong. And they've, they've been misinformed. And they need to be, you know, they, they need to re-examine their position. Next. Yes. Um, do you think that uh, fundamentalist Islam is at all a threat to life in America? I mean, is that an issue that we're really facing, or does that just arise globally now here? If it's global, it's here. So, I mean, within the next 25 years, 25 years, they're expecting that Islam will be the dominant religion throughout Europe. And what did I just say about Europe? So it could go either way. And if that, if that were to happen, then at best, the United States would be the last stronghold and is already the primary target. Next. Did that family that you mentioned earlier ever end up uh, cutting their lawn or picking their lawn? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I never obviously kept contact with them, so I can't report about them. I, I've had so many occasions like that. You know, I remember one, part, the, the, one of the things that first drove me away from religion was this girl in middle school. I, I was like 12, and this, this cute girl in my, in my school asked me to walk her home. So, of course, I followed her like a puppy, right? I thought she was interested in me. It turned out that her family charged her with picking up a stray to bring home so they could proselytize. So I walk in the house and I meet her family and they're all really nice for about a minute or so and suddenly they start speaking in tongues and writhing on the floor and shouting damnation and telling me that any minute now, this is 1976, that Jesus is coming back and they're going to vanish and I'm going to be in a lake of fire. And I remember crying, not because of the reason they thought, but because this was the first time I'd ever been in a madhouse. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you. Oh, wait, one, one more. The ultimate goal of atheism is to negate all value to the word that we apply to ourselves. It should not be that you identify as the minority who does not believe impossible nonsense for no good reason. Sane people should be in the majority. And again, I said sane, and people are going to criticize me because, you know, I'm sorry, no. If it's irrational, I'm going to call it insane. I know it's not pathological. I know it's not a clinical error. Or clinical error? Ailment. Okay. I understand the difference between, you know, insanity and medical terms. I'm just talking about irrational decisions and, and, and belief systems that are not based on fact or care about truth. And very often you can get these people to admit that they don't. And what it is for me is, as I said, when somebody professes that they believe in talking snakes and donkeys and, and that they, they expect that the world is about to end and that we need to bring on this, this apocalyptic war, it, why are we electing those people based on those criteria? We should be looking at exactly opposite criteria for the people that we put in power and the, the policies that we pursue. <laughs>